All right. Well, if you're a man, you're in the right place. Uh, good to see you men here and hope you've been enjoying the conference as much as I have. It's been uh, just a rich, rich feast for my soul. And I think that everybody I'm talking to is feeling the same way. Um, I want to welcome you to this session on Christ-like manhood. And the message uh, that I'm going to give right now is obviously not going to answer every question on biblical manhood in an hour, uh, but I'm going to point you to some help in that regard. The message is going to build on yesterday's uh, message on the gentleness of Christ, because basically, Christ-like manhood is about following Christ's example of meekness, empowered by His Holy Spirit, empowered by the Word, and to the glory of God. That's how we live as men. So it's just living the Christian life, but doing that as a man in our specific roles, submitting to God in the role that He has given us as men in the world. So just to set uh, some of the context that we're in, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time here on setting the context that we're living in and living through because you men live in the same world I do. You see the same news I do and you see the same discouraging signs uh, that I do. There are many rabbit trails we could pursue, lots of books out there on toxic masculinity, criticizing men as toxic, and some of, there's some responses criticizing all the books that are criticizing men as toxic. Uh, lots of books on the crises of men and boys, uh, men who have lost their place, lost their status, lost their way, lost all their moral compass, on and on goes, and really it's a loss of male identity. Rabbit trails lead, if we follow, if we were to follow them, the rabbit trails lead uh, to several places that offer explanations, good explanations, uh, as to the cause of the demise of men and manhood in our day. Uh, I, I think we've all gone back to C.S. Lewis. He sounded an alarm back in the 1940s about the subverting power of modern education uh, to deconstruct values in the abolition of man, those, that series of three lectures, it was turned into a little book, uh, producing men without chests is how he described the crisis of uh, his time. Francis Schaeffer, Schaeffer also in the 1970s and 80s traced the West's demise due to the Enlightenment. In the 1990s, this is uh, when I was starting to come up and learn theology. I appreciated the work of David Wells and James Montgomery Boyce, John MacArthur, men who saw the secularizing power of modernity, and obviously that led to a scourge of pragmatism, worldly innovation in the evangelical church that really eroded and gutted its theology. And obviously, gutting the church of its theology. So when men do not think theologically, then if anything else is at the center of their thinking, the center of their heart, and the center of their life, it's going to lead to a crisis of manhood, a crisis of the family, and that's certainly what we've seen. Most recently, Carl Truman, in his excellent book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, all of you should read that, by the way, if you haven't, uh, you really should, or at least get the a copy, the shorter version, which is called Strange New World. Both of those books are excellent. And if you're a pastor or an elder, I would, I would, I would recommend that you go through both David Wells. He's got a four, four books that started coming out in the, in the 90s, No Place for Truth, God in the Wasteland, Losing Our Virtue, and Above All Earthly Powers. Excellent books. And then also go through Carl Truman's The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, the bigger one. Go through that with your elders and make sure that you digest just to, just to understand the lay of the land, the world that we're living in. I'm not going to repeat all that, but Carl Truman traces how the, some esoteric and anti-Christian philosophies in men like Rousseau and Nietzsche and Marx and Darwin and Freud all kind of congealed and then seeped into popular culture over centuries and really have devolved into a death culture in our time. So we've, we're seeing, we're living through the results of that. If you understand the philosophies or not, you're seeing the fruits of all that uh, gone to seed in our time. All of these men, from their different perspectives, have produced, we might say, a series of, of coroner's reports on the cause of death in the West. They're all versions of the same theme, which is really 
the cultural or social societal death that Paul traced in Romans chapter 1, and that repeated refrain, God gave them over. God gave them over. Three times he says it there. Men suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. They refused to glorify God as God or give thanks to him. So there's no gratitude in their hearts, and there's no sense of the honor of God, giving God his due, and they professed to be wise and yet became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, in, in the, or images made in the image of mortal man and corruptible man. And therefore, God handed them over. He gave them over to first to sexual immorality and then to homosexual immorality and then to a debased mind. And that's where we're living today. That's what we're seeing in the media. That's what we're seeing uh, in our politics, a debased mind. Does this judgment of God that has come over our land, come over the entire Western world, does it affect how men understand and practice manhood? You bet it does. But rather than spend a lot of time digging through that cadaver or corpse for ourselves of Western manhood and see how it all went wrong, I'd like to use our time a little more profitably, positively, uh, looking biblically to chart the way forward for us as Christian men. I came into, uh, became a Christian uh, just before I turned 20 years old, and I didn't understand any of the philosophies that had been uh, uh, perpetrated upon me. I didn't, I, it was part of the cultural air that I breathed. In fact, a lot of what I grew up with in the culture is what drove me into I would say like an action-oriented career. It was a lot of popular culture and popular media and popular books that made that, uh, those kind of romantic notions of dying on some foreign battlefield, my body riddled with bullets and all my rounds expended and all my grenades thrown. I thought that would be a glorious way to die. I thought that would be a good idea. As I've gotten older, I kind of like the fact that I don't have any extra holes. I, I'd rather be going to bed at night and die in my sleep. I think I'm, I'm more uh, inclined toward that now. But back when I was a young man, that didn't seem so attractive. Where was I getting all that? I, I've, I've looked back and realized I ate and drank and, and slept and breathed in the culture. And it, it actually moved me in directions that I wasn't even aware of. I was just like all the sons of wrath, children of wrath in Ephesians chapter 2, I was moved along by the spirit of the power of the air. It wasn't until I was regenerated that I kind of woke up and thought, this Bible is amazing. And look what, the, look what the Bible talks about with regard to men, and I want to be like that. In fact, I had no aspirations to be a pastor or an elder, but it was, through, it was my first read-through through the Bible. Uh, I was off on a deployment, and I remember reading through Ephesians and uh, reading through 1 Timothy. I saw in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 the qualifications for eldership. As I said, I had no interest in becoming an elder or a pastor, but I saw what an elder was like, and I thought, I am not like that at all, but I want to be. That's exactly the kind of man that I want to be. I want to be noble and dignified and godly and holy. That's a, a change that the Spirit produced and he's just been doing that work in my life ever since. So, that's what I want to commend to you if you are a regenerate uh, believer, if you're a Christian, uh, you are already on the path toward biblical manhood, Christ-like manhood. And I'm going to give you five words to kind of organize our thoughts on the subject of Christ-like manhood. They're these five words, pattern, pride, power, perseverance, and picture. Pattern, pride, power, perseverance, and picture. The first word is pattern. And you just might extend that if you're taking any notes. The pattern of Christ-like manhood. The pattern of Christ-like manhood. Let me read from Genesis. This is a familiar text, so you don't need to turn there if you don't want to. But Genesis 1, 26 and following, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over their, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so, there's the pronouncement, there's the decree, and here's the action. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then the narrative goes on. Many have in Given, good, given us good books and interpretation and elaboration on the covenant language that's used there, uh, the dominion mandate, uh, the be fruitful, multiply, uh, fill the earth, subdue it, exercise dominion, such good theology comes out of Genesis 1 and 2. But we see that God made mankind in his image and he made him in two distinct types. One male, one female. I made the male to lead, and to teach, and the female to be a fitting helper for the male. Both of them coming together, needing one another in order to fulfill that command to be fruitful. They can't be fruitful alone. They need to come together. And so coming together to be fruitful, they're going to come to do together to fill the earth, subdue it, and exercise dominion. The male in the leadership role, the teaching role, the female being the fitter, fitting helper for the male. Two of them are going to enjoy their work together in an intimate partnership with one another, being fruitful and exercising dominion. Now, we're not going to get too detailed, but just by casual observation of the biology of Adam and Eve, men and women are not only different, but they are different to one another in a complementary fashion, bringing them together. Obviously, they join together and they're they're perfectly suited for one another. In fact, the man, by God's design, not only in his, his superficial features and his biology and his, his bone structure and his muscle density and his fast twitch muscles, which made him make him react better to situations, um, even in his body chemistry and his hormones, uh, more testosterone for, uh, for a man and less estrogen. For a female, it's flipped. More estrogen, less testosterone, smaller bone structure, smaller frame. Uh, the beauty, the tenderness, the, uh, the gentleness that you see in the woman, she's perfectly suited, designed by God and suited for her role as Adam's helpmeet. So the man is the head of the woman, the authority over the woman. He leads her in love, and the woman is perfectly suited to be his helper. She is a co-equal partner in the fruitfulness and exercising dominion. Now, noting the biological differences, we can also see in the narrative in Genesis chapter 2 in particular, we can see the divine intent in the order in which God created the man first and then the woman. Paul commands Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.12, disallowing, as you all understand, disallowing women to teach and exercise authority over man in the church. And the first reason that he gives comes, uh, comes uh, or refers back to the order of creation. He says in 1 Timothy 2.13, for Adam was formed first and then Eve. Why does that matter? What is important that Paul is drawing attention to in the order of creation, Adam being formed first and then Eve? Why does that matter? Because in the gap of time, between the creation of of man and then creation of woman, God did a lot with Adam that Eve was not on the earth to experience. God exposed Adam to the world, gave him his work assignment, taught him to work the garden and keep it, taught him to distinguish between the trees, identifying one tree in particular that is completely off limits. Broad permission he gives to Adam to eat freely in Genesis 2.16. He says, you may surely eat. The the Hebrew is, eating you may eat. So it's it's a magnanimous permission, broad permission to eat of every tree in the garden except for one. Very one very important exception, because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Not a tree for eating. That's a tree for looking at, learning, observing something about God and his holiness, and man in his obedience, his due obedience and worship to God is to keep away from that tree and not eat from it. Where is Eve during all of this? 
As Adam is exposed to the world that he lives in, as he sees the four rivers, as he hears about the minerals that are in the ground, as, as he's, he's discovering and God is, is explaining the world to him, charting its geography. Uh, Jeff Williams is a NASA astronaut who just recently retired from NASA. Long, illustrious career for a long time. He held the, long, the record for being the longest man going around the earth on the International Space Station. But he loves this section of Scripture because it points to the basis of all science. God encourages Adam through what he's set up in the garden, what he's exposing Adam in, to in the garden. He's setting up Adam's investigator, like stirring his investigative juices, stirring his scientific, his desire for scientific inquiry to learn about the earth that he has been placed in. So he can exercise dominion, get the copper out of the ground, and put copper in wires and conduct electricity and all the things that we enjoy, all of it is there. And he's just encouraging Adam. Where's Eve during all this exposure? Where's Eve during the command that God, when God gave the command about the single tree not to eat? She's not yet in existence. She's not there. She's not there for the permission or the restriction. She's not there for the exposure to the world. She's not there for the work assignments, not there for the naming of the animals, which is the very first exercise of authority and dominion that God gives to Adam to name something as to exercise authority over that thing. Adam did all these things. He experienced all these things prior to God creating Eve. And so, Adam, just by virtue of being created first and Eve being created second, God has put Adam in the role of a leader, in the role of a teacher. He's a teacher who is motivated to teach and lead by love because he is burdened with the knowledge that one tree in particular in that place is deadly. And so he didn't want to see this beautiful creature that God conducted the very first surgery, brought out Eve out of his rib and out of his side and closed up the place with flesh and that he woke up from that surgery having been properly anesthetized to that uh, pain she brings her to him, and he is overjoyed. Uh, not, a, not an animal, not, a, not an animal like any of the ones he's just been naming all day. Now, this is a beautiful creature, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and he is rejoicing. But at the same time, he's looking at that tree and looking at his wife and looking at that tree and saying, I've got to tell her about that tree. He's motivated by love, by concern. That is the... That is the motivation for our teaching and our leadership, and it's the pattern set up right here in the beginning. So much more to see in Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 3 especially, as we see sin entered into the world, but that is enough to make a very simple point that God created Adam to be stronger than Eve in order to provide for her needs, to protect her from harm. He created Adam first putting him in the position of being a leader and a teacher for his wife. His strength for leading and teaching is not a self-serving strength. It is not to serve his self-centered hobbies. It's God made men to serve those who are weaker than they are, to provide for the needy, protect the weak and the vulnerable. That's why they're stronger. If you have strength, you have responsibility whether it's intellectual strength or, or financial strength or physical strength or whatever, whatever the strength that God has given you, and we're all different, but God has given you something to use to protect and provide for the weak and the vulnerable around you. Now, I'm gonna make a huge leap from the first man, Adam, who failed to provide and protect for his, uh, provide for and protect his wife um, because he failed to obey God. He transgressed in full knowledge because God spoke to him. He failed. And then he failed to protect his wife, failed to provide for her as he should. But we're going to go to the last Adam, Jesus Christ. We've got limited time, a lot to cover. But what is the pattern that we find in the manhood of Jesus Christ? Does this pattern of manhood from the very beginning hold true in him? Of course it does. Because Christ used his almighty power, his infinite power, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I can't remember which speaker made this point. I think it might have been Phil Johnson who said that Christ never did a miracle to serve himself. He never served himself with his miracles and never, never thought, uh, you know, I could really use a nice, cool, tall drink here. No, poof, and drink, and 
He, he never did that. That's, that was the temptation to make for himself bread after 40 days of not eating, and he refused that temptation. He resisted that. His miracles were always for the, the weak, the vulnerable, those who were hurting, sick, demon-possessed. It's a remarkable point. Loving the church, Christ gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5.25. So men are to love their wives as themselves, looking to his pattern, serving them, sacrificing for them, giving up of themselves for them. And why did Jesus Christ sacrifice and serve? To what purpose? To what end? I think Pastor Tom Askell just said it in the last session, that the church should be holy and blameless, spotless, beautiful, majestic. This refers to Christ's provision and his protection, but his provision for the church, to protect her from harm, but also to provision her that she would be suited for every good purpose, that holding her up like a beautiful bride in white, she is beautiful, holy. Some men spend a lot of time at work to provide for their family's needs. We live in a fallen world, and the ground that we work is cursed. And it doesn't matter if you don't actually have tactile exposure to the ground in farming uh, or in ranching or whatever uh, gets us really close to the earth, it, it, even if you're a CPA or if you're a teacher or whatever it is, whatever line of work you're in, it is under the curse. And it is hard and it exacts a lot from us, a lot of time, a lot of energy, and so it is always going to be a struggle. Uh, people talk about the work-life ba you know, work balance or work-home balance. I just say, man, sometimes that balance is impossible to achieve. Sometimes your job is just requiring of you a lot of effort and a lot of intentionality because you've got to pay your, <clears throat> pay your dues at the low end of the totem pole as you ride and try to make more money for your family. I understand that. Some men, though, spend far too much time in the workplace. And we need to be cautious about that, don't we? Some men prepare themselves to protect their family, uh, going to the pistol range, buying a shotgun, installing a security system in their home, taking jujitsu classes. Okay, that's all good too. But is that all that there is to provision and protection? Putting food on the table and keeping the bad guys away. No. What about the spiritual provision of our families, our homes? What about it, even if you're single? What about the spiritual provision for others in your life who need your help? What about their spiritual protection? The pattern of manhood means providing for our family's spiritual needs, protecting them from error, from bad influences that enter into the home, per perhaps distractions entering into their home through these little, I, I like to call these, these little personal uh, surveillance devices that also make phone calls. Have you seen these? If you carry them into your home, uh, that's what you're bringing in. But you also have uh, a lot of nifty little gadgets on there and a lot of little portholes into many uh, fields of opportunity, and some of them are quite deadly. Um, one uh, yesterday, someone was uh, giving a presentation on covenant eyes and uh, encouraging the church to get involved in trying to protect men. And she gave a uh, a staggering uh, statistic about 70% of men in the church, Christians, professing Christians, who are struggling with pornography. I can't remember exactly what, how, the language that she used. But he, I, I, that seems awfully high. Uh, but even if it's lower than that, I mean, what percentage would you accept in your churches of men struggling with pornography? How about we accept 0%? How about no men are doing that? Are you your brother's keeper? Because you ought to be. We do not need to be married with children to be providers and protectors. Young men who have no wife or family or men who are married but have no children, you still have people around you that you're responsible to care for. You're responsible to teach and lead. Find somebody around you who knows less than you and tell them what you know. Help them to grow, disciple them, take their care 
their spiritual provision and protection upon yourself and help a brother out, help a sister out. So, married or unmarried, your ability to provide and protect for your family, for others you, uh, who look to you, it depends upon your own strength and maturity in Christ. And so, to provide and protect, to fulfill our role as men, where do we need to be? What is the training center for the Christian man? The local church, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 16. Spend time there and see how important a sound, faithful local church is. I, I'm surprised about how many men, strong men, very capable men, providing well, protecting well. I wouldn't want to mess with any of them in the dark alley. And yet they keep taking their families week after week after week to a crummy, weak, insipid church. And they wonder, why are my kids keep on wandering off? Why is my wife in this uh, little study group with all the women talking about their dreams and charismatic experiences? Maybe you ought to get them into a strong, sound church. Get them out of that place and take them to where they're going to be fed, where you're going to be fed, where you are strengthened in your heart, strengthened in your maturity to lead your family. So, this brings us to a second point and a second word, the word pride. The word pride. The pride of Christ-like manhood. We know, we know that pride is a bad word, right? Uh, we're Christians. Pride is bad. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. But let me, ask, let me ask you this question, try to get around to the point this way. What is it that you most like to talk about? Just hanging out with a buddy, shoot the breeze, maybe you guys are watching sports together, whatever. What is it that you most like to talk about? Maybe you don't always get around to talking about it due to the environment that you're in or maybe even fear of what people may think about your thoughts, whatever it is, but deep down, what is it that you like to talk about the most? Because whatever the answer to that question is, that is something that you take pride in. I'm using the word pride. The biblical concept is boasting, and the Bible has a lot to say about boasting. Boasting on the one hand and shame on the other. The verb for boasting is kaukaomai. It means to boast or take pride in. That's where I get the word pride for the point there. But to take pride in, to boast in, to glory in. The heaviest usage is concentrated in the Corinthian letters about boasting, about pride, as you might guess. The word boast, uh, it, it's, it's an important thing to understand as men because it gets to the heart of what we really love and what we hate. It gets to the heart of our affections, what we love, what we hate, what we gravitate toward and what we're repelled from. The world boasts in all kinds of external things, right? Men take pride in power, in wealth, in their wisdom, in their mental acuity, in their beauty, in their fame, and things like that, all of which, by the way, men are not responsible for, men and women, they're not responsible for those things. Paul noted that in his rebuke in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. He said, what do you have that you didn't receive? I mean, if you, if you, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? You are not a say of yourself. A saity is not an attribute due to you, but only to God. So why do you boast as if you hadn't received it, as if you came up with this on your own? Still, men boast, and they take pride in what God has given and what God has distributed to them and what God has provided for them, whether it's strength or intellect or experience or, or exposure or education, whatever it is. And that is fundamentally the heart of all worldliness, to elevate the self and boast in and glory in oneself. Taking pride in oneself and one's accomplishments and one's own strength is is really the chief commodity of the modern world. Marketing physical strength to young men who look up to other men like Jocko Willink or David Groggins, you know, special forces guys. They've got war fighting credibility. They've got discipline routines. They've got experiences from battle. They've got ripped muscles. All of that is commoditized, packaged, and sold, often in podcasts, but also books, um, put into movies, and all the rest. 
They market, people market these days intellectual strength of men like Jordan Peterson, rhetorical strength of a Ben Shapiro, cultural prowess of a Joe Rogan. Whatever YouTube algorithms serve up, young men are buying and taking in and drinking in, and you need to look around to the young men in your life and see what their ex- exposure is. What are their influences? What are they digesting when those earbuds are in and they're just sitting quietly in the corner? What are they taking in? I don't, wanna, I don't want you to misunderstand me here. I'm not putting down what strong, intelligent, accomplished men, what they've done in life. I'm not putting that down at all. I'm not even putting down or criticizing how they make money. Uh, people do all kinds of things to make money, writing books, doing podcasts, and all those things. I'm not, I'm not concerned about that for our sake. I am concerned about the tendency of men and Christian men, and especially young Christian men, who are looking to worldly men as examples. Worldly men who take pride in the self, take pride in the things that they have received from God. It really is a stewardship. They're going to give an answer to, of, their, of their stewardship to Christ. But what's my concern here? I do not want to see any man, a Christian man, fall prey to yet another worldly philosophy that makes merchandise of them, that's going to yet again shackle them to yet another performance-oriented form of self-salvation, becoming the best you, becoming your better self. Because all of that, if it's oriented in works and it's generated from us, it's another form of enslavement, not freedom. For Christ-like men, our boasting must be in God and in God alone. Like a young son looks up to his father with admiration and pride, and his, his heart is like glowing with, with rejoicing in his father's strength and his father's abilities and accomplishments. I mean, his father, it doesn't matter what he does in life, he walks on water. That's how our hearts ought to look up to our God to take pride as Christians in our God, to boast in what he is and who he is and what he has done. Paul makes this point to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 10, 17. Also, he makes it earlier in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, starting in verse 26. He makes the point in 1 Corinthians 1, 31, but let me start back in verse 26. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. There is a boasting that is totally appropriate. There is a pride that we can have that is so appropriate to boast in who our God is and what he has accomplished. None of our cultural heroes will regard the church of Jesus Christ or the members of the church of Jesus Christ. We are easily dismissed by the world, marginalized, set aside, mocked as weak and stupid and foolish. No matter, says the Lord, Jeremiah 9.23, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows Me. It's A.W. Tozer who said, what a man thinks about God is the most important thing about him. What do you think about God? Are your thoughts about God deep enough and high enough and broad enough? Do you have a comprehensive view of the glory of Christ as Joel Beakey gave to us, a prophet, priest, and king? Do you submit to him as prophet, priest, and king in your life? That's the most important thing about you. And the more you do that, the more you will boast in your God. You're you're boasting in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.30 is grounded in your union and identity with Jesus Christ. Christ Christ-like manhood begins with true identity. Not on worldly forms, not on worldly comparisons, but our true identity, which if we're Christians, it's in Christ. 
Paul says in Ephesians 1, 4, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, before any of us had even been had come into existence, before we'd done anything good or bad, before there was anything that we could even try to boast about an accomplishment, God did it. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us, get this, for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That text and so many others in scripture establishes our identity in God, anchors our origin in the sovereign will of God. We're the results of God's sovereign choice. He made a choice, we weren't there to contribute to it one way or another, God made the choice. And our teleology, our end is predetermined by divine purpose. Our lives serve the highest of all possible ends to bring praise to the glorious grace of God. That's what we're here for. That's why we exist. And as that text makes clear, our identity is grounded in a relationship with God that is one of father to son through the, the beauty of adoption. Listen to this from, I know some of you would be familiar with this, from chapter 12 of the London Baptist Confession of Faith. All those that are justified... God vouchsafed in and for the sake of his only son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption by which they are taken into the number and enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God and have his name put upon them, receive the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace with boldness, are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by him as a father, as by a father, and yet never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption and inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. That's pretty good stuff from the confession of faith, isn't it? As partakers of the grace of adoption, we enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God. God has been pleased to place his holy name upon us. His name being all that he is, he attaches to us. Is that amazing? As his characteristics and qualities are made manifest in us, we give evidence that we truly are his sons. As God's sons, we're granted special privilege of drawing near to him because we're covered by his affection we're provided for, atoned for, protected by him as our father. And so we look to God, our creator, for our meaning. We look to him and him alone for our significance. We anchor our hearts to the one who is perfect and good and wise, one who never changes, never changes his mind. So if God is the perfect father, he's the pattern of our fatherhood. I know there are a lot of people, a lot of men who say, hey, I didn't have a I didn't have a good upbringing with my father. I didn't have a good model. I, I, in fact, my father left when, when I was young. I didn't even know him. Or he was inconsistent, or he was adulterous, or he was a thief, or he was a, a lazy man, or, or whatever the case is, or maybe he had a great father. Listen, fathers, human fathers, there is something always going to be a model in them that points up to God but it's ultimately God whom we look to as for our, our model of fatherhood. And if God is our father, Christ is our brother. If Christ is the one and only son of God and we are adopted sons of God, Christ is our older brother. And he's first in the birth order. He is the natural born brother, so to speak. Since Christ has first place in the family, we look up to him all the time for our pattern of sonship, so we can learn from him what it means to be a man. Whenever you see men, even professing Christian men, promoting some aesthetic as manhood, you know, in appearance, manhood looks like this, and you see images of that, images of strength, or images of projecting a bit of bravado, that kind of thing, question that immediately. Those are insecure men who are trying to overcompensate for an insecurity that they feel. Don't look to that. Look instead to meek men, men who are not gonna blow a trumpet, men who are not gonna call attention to themselves and 
They'll say to you, imitate me as I imitate Christ. They're following after a different pattern. Whenever you see men taking pride in physical strength, intellectual strength, whenever you get this sense of boasting and what men are accomplishing and what they're doing and what they're producing and what they're writing and all the stuff that, that they are pointing to themselves, even subtly, turn away from them and return to Christ. You know what men fear the most? Think about what you fear the most. Failure, weakness, failing to provide and protect for people who depend on you, failing to perform when you're called upon to perform, failure to produce, failure to fulfill responsibilities, looking foolish, feeling ashamed. All these things are really what get to men. They really at the heart, are at the heart of what our, our concerns are. And following all those other teachers and all those other voices and all those other influencers, following that kind of stuff will always promote human factors, human pride, what they can accomplish. And the moment you start going after them, you've shackled yourselves again to a same kind of enslavement of a work salvation. Turn away, turn away. When we boast in what God has done, in what he has accomplished in Christ, the pressure, it lifts, because it's not on you. It's not on us. It relieves us from all the pressure to perform and produce, because you know what? The performance, the production, the fruitfulness, it all comes from God. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who caused the growth. All glory to God. This is setting our identity where it belongs setting our identity in Christ and Christ alone. It provides a secure foundation in truth for an eternal, unfading, unchanging significance of you as a man. And it's something that will never change and so you never have to question it. So from the standpoint of boasting in God, being completely secure of our standing in Christ, we're ready to discover, third point, our true power. So the power, number three, the power of Christ-like manhood. The power of Christ-like manhood is really simply walking the way that Christ walked, taking every step as he did in the Spirit of God. We're to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, by letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, Colossians 3.16. Another way of saying Ephesians 5.17 and following, don't be foolish, understand what the, world, uh, the will of the Lord is. Um, don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. Be being filled with the Spirit, and being filled with the Spirit is being filled with the Word. The same things result from Ephesians 5.18 and following, Colossians 3.16 and following, the same results. Christ walked in the power of the Word and the Spirit. He, ser he served up all the time in his teaching, elevated thoughts, elevated speech, elevated wisdom. They were like apples of gold in settings of silver. He always aimed his words accurately and carefully. His words were like well-driven nails. They will sanctify you. We're to walk in the Spirit not in the flesh, by cleansing ourselves, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, from every defilement of the body and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's how Christ walked, in the power of holiness and purity, never compromised by sin, never defiled in his conscience. He was never confused in his thinking, untouched by sin. We're to walk in the spirit and not by the flesh by growing consistent in the pursuit of Christian virtue. Memorize 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. If all those virtues are growing and increasing in you, you will have a secure foundation, you'll have a ready entrance into heaven. Christ walked in the power of that kind of virtue. He walked with a conscience clean from any sin, enabled him to reason clearly, think clearly, supple mind, able to answer and give a good answer. We're to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, by growing in the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, to 23, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of those you understand are attributes of Christ. That's how Christ is. It's a picture of how he walked. It's the fruit that, that characterized his life. 
He walked in the power of the fruit of the Spirit, and that fruit of the Spirit covered him when he walked through life like scales of armor, guarded him in battle. In fact, Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, that whole picture of the Christian's complete armor, that's Christ. That's Christ. That's how he walked, scaled with armor, guarded him in battle. And the fruit of the Spirit was an aim point for his arrows, giving him pinpoint accuracy in every word and every action. Listen, when we're filled with the Spirit under His control, when we walk in holiness, grow in virtue, when we're producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, this is the power of Christ-like manhood. Power, spiritual power, divine power at work in our lives. Now, I'm gonna dial in the focus a little bit on three points. The pursuit of meekness, the pursuit of holiness, and the pursuit of prayer, the practice of prayer, we could say. These three points help to just kind of dial in the focus a little bit on where our power comes from, in meekness, holiness, and prayer. As Christian men, we're to pursue meekness, which means we battle every single day for rightly aligned and well-ordered affections. Yesterday's plenary session, looking at the example of Christ and his meekness, we heard the command for us to follow him in obedience. He says, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, right? And learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Come, learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. How do we do that? How do we follow him in obedience? Especially when we think about the aspect of not only kindness of meekness, but also the restraint and even the composure of meekness. How can we love God with a holy zeal like he did, which for Christ was all-consuming and yet not sin? It'll come by the restraining power of the Spirit. Paul commands, Ephesians 4.26, be angry, do not sin. Anger is a command in Ephesians 4.26. We're not allowed to be stoic and, and dispassionate. We're not allowed to be emotionally checked out and uninvolved. We're to be passionate and zealous. Anger can only be righteous when our indignation is righteous. That is, when it's aligned with God's love of his own glory, God's love of his own holiness, God's love of his own name. So, a righteous anger reacts against anything that opposes God's, God's glory, God's name, God's holiness. Righteous anger begins with self-examination to make sure we're indignant over our own sin first. That we mortify our own sin first. Obviously, everything that defends God should, and profanes God should offend us, whether it's in ourselves or in others or in society or in the culture, but all too often, we're looking outward and externally and not looking inward at our own sin, are we? We're often very willing to, you know, fight the culture wars with weapons of carnality, which is another way, really just another way of offending God and committing sin. Paul continues in Ephesians 4.26, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Why is that? So we don't give any opportunity for the devil. Listen, we're most vulnerable to the devil's schemes when we're least wary of him. And when is that? It's when we think our cause is most righteous. That's what the Pharisees were like. When they thought their cause was most righteous, they were most deadly and most dangerous, willing to put the Son of God to death. So be angry. Be zealous for God's glory. Be passionate for his name and for his holiness. Be angry, but be on your guard because you are most vulnerable when you think you stand tall. Do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. In, let, in other words, don't delay in dealing with your anger righteously before God. Here's a second point of focus. Mortify your sin daily in the pursuit of holiness, in the pursuit of repentance. We're to be constant repenters, aren't we? I mentioned John Owen earlier, and I realize many of you know about volume six of his works. Many of you have probably read his treatise on mortification. I, I love that and encourage you to read that, but also read his treatise on temptation. He, in that treatise, he unpacks how Jesus taught his disciples to resist temptation. Matthew 26, 41 is the verse he unpacks. Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. You know temptation is a most wily and clever enemy, and it will visit you when you least expect it, right? So watch diligently. Keep your head on a swivel. L be like a guard at a guard post. What does he do when he sees the enemy outside the wire lurking out in the woods? 
Does he, gathering, gathering together for an attack, does he jump down from his guard post and leave everybody behind and go off and attack the enemy by himself? No. He doesn't do it alone. He knows he could be killed. He calls for reinforcements. He gets on the radio. Well, the Christian has to learn to watch like a guard on duty in a war zone. Eyes peeled for any movement, enemy movement, ears alert for any sound of his footsteps. And when he spots something, when he sees something, when he hears something, he turns immediately to God in prayer and calls in fire support, artillery, bombs to ask God to obliterate the enemy force. And God delights to answer those prayers. Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. The segues into the third point of focus. How do we pursue a meek spirit? Passionate and holy, indignant about sin. This commitment to meekness is what drives us to holiness and drives us to prayer. We remember Christ continuously prayed all through his ministry. And it makes sense when Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 2 1, first of all, I urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all people. In verse 2 to 7, he describes Christ's mediatorial work for all kinds of sinners. And then in verse 8, he says, I desire then that in every place men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Men take the concerns of their righteous anger to God in prayer. That's what he means, what Paul means when he says, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Deal with your anger. Take it directly to God in prayer. Cast every care upon him. Express your outrage. Seek your justice. Ask for wisdom in all things because you do not want to sin in your indignation. So be often in prayer. Be instant in prayer. Be insistent in prayer. And by doing that, men avoid the sin of unrighteous anger. They deny the devil any opportunity to tempt them to sin. And more than that, men obey that positive command, be angry. Oh yeah, be emotional, be passionate, be zealous about that. Their passions for righteousness, zeal for holiness, all the affections of love and hate by their anger, men do what is good. Their forces for good in the world were to be driven by intellect and by passion, emotion, affection, in the chest, in the gut. It's important because that's how God made us. We need to be whole-souled men, mind, affections, and will, all working together for God's glory. And then what you pray for, you work for. By praying, Christian men act in a godly, dignified way. They don't storm the capital, engage in rioting with the rest of the pagans whose only hope is in this life. We're not trying to make utopia here. We know Christ is coming. Christian men offload their passions in prayer. They appeal to the God who has the power to do something about it. They seek the wisdom of his spirit. They obey the lordship of Christ. And they look to the one who has the power to do something about it. And if they're going to be his agents, they're going to be his agents in holiness. Now, how long do we go on exercising the power of God in pursuing this Christ-like manhood? Let me give you a fourth word. It's the word perseverance. Perseverance the perseverance of Christ-like manhood. Christ-like manhood means faithfulness, means endurance in duty, devotion, sacrificial servant-hearted leadership over the long haul, over the lifetime. We always respect, and whether it's football or basketball or whatever, we respect those teams that rise to the level, not just of winning a world championship, but but actually doing that year after year after year, because once they win one, then they're the target of every other team in the league, right? It's those teams that can rise to that level of, in, 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 of endurance and performance over the long haul and create what's called a dynasty, right? That's what we're after as men. Not the sprint, but the long haul. Faithfulness, endurance. Paul said this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God, but it's required of stewards, they'd be found what? Faithful, right? Men, our manhood, like all things, is a stewardship from God. And we're gonna give an account for our stewardship to him. God does not mark our, res- our, our, our success in terms of results, in terms of numbers, because it's God who gives increase and withholds increase. He's watching us every single day, in the private and the public, and he's watching us over the long haul. 
And what he regards, what he counts as success, is faithfulness. And oftentimes, it's faithfulness in the mundane, routine aspects of life. It's in the things that nobody else can see, but you can see, and God can see it. That's where he marks faithfulness, staying faithful, day after day, in the little things, in the tenderness you show toward your children, in the, in the gentleness you show towards your wife, and all those kind of things, that's manhood. Let me draw your attention to the text that Dr. Askell used to open the conference. If you'd like to turn to 2 Timothy 2, this is where we'll kind of wrap it up. He says in 2 Timothy 2, 1, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. How do we get strong as men? Power for Christ-like manhood, spiritual power, power from God, power by the Spirit as we've seen. Then this, verses three to six, are pictures of faithful endurance and several pictures of perseverance here. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And it's a hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Perseverance, endurance, long-term faithfulness means we embrace suffering from the very outset. And we endure suffering continually through our lives as men. We accept that from the very start. If we follow a suffering Savior who died on a cross, and he's the one who turned around and called to us, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, we accept suffering as discipleship. Because our boast is in the Lord, we're gonna follow him. Paul, he had to learn, just as he had to learn, just as Jesus practiced, he always constant in prayer, calling upon God, that gives occasion for God to show his strength for us, for us. Our aim is always to not to please ourselves, but to please him who enlisted us as soldiers in his servants, service. So perseverance, endurance, long-term faithfulness means we don't take steroids. We don't find shortcuts to growth. And I'm not speaking figuratively, uh, I'm speaking figuratively, not, not, uh, not uh, literally uh, with regard to steroids, but there are steroids and shortcuts in the Christian life as well. All kinds of fads blow through the church at all times, so stay away from shortcuts. There's no shortcut to maturity and growth in Christ. We practice self-control, we practice self-discipline like a stellar athlete who competes according to the rules for the sake of the crown of righteousness that the Lord rewards to the faithful. Like a hardworking farmer, getting up, doing his work, not particularly mentally challenging a lot of times to go and sow seed and turn up the soil and make sure it's watered and, and fertilized and all those kind of things, but he's faithful. He gets that job done and he's hardworking and he's diligent and when a blight comes in, he deals with it. Or when a pest comes in, he deals with it. We're to be like soldiers, athletes, farmers. Let me give you one more word as we close, an essential word, the picture of Christ-like manhood. Same text, the picture of Christ-like manhood. What's the picture? 2 Timothy 2, 7. Paul says, think over what I say. Think it over, consider it, and the Lord will give you understanding in everything, and then this, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Remember John MacArthur preaching on this text, he said this, Remember Jesus Christ, the soldier, the greatest soldier, fought the greatest battle, won the greatest victory. Remember Jesus Christ, the greatest athlete who ran the purest race and will win the greatest prize. Remember Jesus Christ, the true sower of the seed, tiller of the ground, reaper of the harvest. Remember Jesus Christ, the preeminent one. Dr. Askell said, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. We're to consider in Jesus Christ the outcome of his manhood, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and now, having risen from the dead, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So remember Jesus Christ. Endure a little longer, persevere, look at the picture. Consider who he is, he's the offspring of David. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
He's the one and only Son of God, also the second Adam, the Son of Man. He is our prototype and He is our archetype. He is our oldest brother. He is also our loving Savior and our eternal Lord. And we always have His help. He cares for us. Remember Jesus Christ, Paul said, is preached in my gospel for which I'm suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. And so he continues in verse 10, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Is that your goal, to endure everything for the sake of the elect? That they also may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy. For if we've died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, he, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Our immutable Christ. Listen, I can't give in one hour or with a hundred hours together all the secrets of biblical manhood, but I can do something far better and far more profitable for you. I know the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And if you know him, he's ready to open all his treasures to you as well. You just need to pursue Christ for Christ-like manhood, amen? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for your fatherhood over us and the sonship of Jesus Christ and you have made us by your grace brothers to him. You've adopted us into your family. You've bid us to come and plead your grace and plead his blood. And he, as we learned in the last, one of the last sessions, he intercedes for us according to your will. We thank you that you have granted us of your Holy Spirit, that he indwells us. He is a, he's caused us to be joined to Christ and adopted into your family, and we have the seal of, his, of the Holy Spirit upon us, keeping us to the very end. If our identity is in you, the triune God, we are untroubled. It lifts, it lifts all the pressure and it puts all the glory and the honor and the majesty where it truly belongs, not on us, but on you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask for your help to grow as men and to encourage others around us to take our duty and responsibility seriously, that we'd act courageously in faith, that we'd walk with the strength that you've given us to protect those around us who are weaker and more vulnerable. Please give us that protector, provider mentality. And if, we, if, any, if there's anything that we lack, please make that up, grant it to us by your spirit and by your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.